Hello, my friends, and welcome to an epilogue of History That Doesn't Suck. I'm your professor as always, Greg Jackson, and Ciel is with me. Hello, everyone. And we are beyond elated to finally epilogue the Civil War, aren't we? <laughs> we can't even tell you. I, we've been working on Civil War episodes for a year. So yeah. It's wild to think about, but it's true. It really is. Uh, first off, though, I think we need a moment of silence for Josh, since he's not with us. That's true. We, it's our first epilogue without Josh yes. behind a mic. So, Josh, this moment of silence represents how much we respect you and care about you, the duration of it. So, here we go. And that was great. And um, <laughs> I'm really, I'm just trying to see if Josh actually still listens. Uh, if I don't get a text telling me that I'm a bastard from him uh, within a week of release, yeah. then I know. Then, exactly. I, then I know to send him that text. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we miss and love you, Josh. All right. So, per the usual, let's talk, let's go ahead and do uh, our little corrections, the things we'd like to note that we wish we just did a titch better. Um, and of course, always thank you to those of you who helped reached us out. out. Yeah, yeah, drew these things to our attention. Uh, and then we're gonna get into some some good hashing here. Yeah, we've got some fun things to discuss, some serious things to discuss, things that didn't fit into any episodes, so some cool extras That's and right. things like that. It's I mean, we're be going great. to Brazil. We're drinking Coca Cola. Yes, we're talking about repeating rifles. It's going to be exciting. It's exciting. Oh yeah, it's good stuff. But okay, so to to the corrections, I uh, I'm gonna go ahead and call this one the most egregious. The first one here. And That's true. So episode 65, we we knew better, we wrote better, but sometimes, alas, our <laughs> human failings. Uh, episode 65, we refer to Lieutenant General Leonidas Polk as a Catholic bishop. We know better than that. He's What's wrong with us? Episcopalian. Sorry. And that one was so egregious that we even bothered our, our dear friends over at Airship and uh, sent in a recording of that sentence to fix it. So if you go back and listen to it, you will now hear Episcopalian Bishop. Uh, not that I don't care about pronunciation things, but I can't fix all of those. That's humanly impossible. But, you know, that was, that would need to be straightened out. Yeah, it did. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you. I actually don't remember who, someone just made a comment in passing on one of our social media platforms. Yeah. And saw it quickly went, oh my gosh, no, please. We said Catholic and the heart sinks and stomach turns as sure. as you know see how my perfectionist ways yeah. it does with any such little you know thing okay um do you, do you want the next one yeah sure so uh we got uh was this one an email from via, don? via twitter oh yes, yes a tweet yes. we got a tweet from don in washington state not dc yes that pointed out how little we know about physics and it, it turns out that you know my high school physics course was just not enough to Not quite make, there. To make yeah. me a physics expert. Uh, so we said- I caught a solid B of some sort in my 101 <laughs> class sure. in generals far longer ago than I want to remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I yeah. think my high school physics teacher gave me a B out of pity more than- Right. You know, I mean, merit. There, the, there's a reason we went the history route and not Pretty the- much. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, it was my lowest grade in undergrad, I think. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at any rate. And I didn't take it in undergrad. Oh, so. you didn't? Oh, no. <laughs> no. I, I, I want to say you made better life choices than me, but I'm sorry. I feel like Don's going to be going, what What the hell, I mean, Greg? I took biology and chemistry. <laughs> Give me a break. Just didn't take physics. Fair enough. Fair enough. Anyhow, go ahead. So Don, who calls himself a pedantic engineering professor. <laughs> <laughs> Which I loved. Thank you, Don. Yeah, Don, he's just being kind. He is. You know? He is. Very yeah. self-effacing humor. Love it. Yes. So he pointed out that at... We botched a physics joke. We did. Oh Sorry. my goodness. Did we not know which episode that was in? We didn't. Uh, it was when uh, the, uh, a train was being derailed. Oh, well. Yeah. But yeah, we should have noted that. That's okay. Thanks for the help, Don. Yes. Thank you. And uh, alas, you can you can go back and listen to that one, uh, The uh, the uh, all the physicists out there. And yeah. Go, huh, they might know their history, but well... That's okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, I think really that is kind of those it. are Yeah, those are our main fixes beyond, of course. We know we have mispronounced things a few times. We Here sure do try. And yep. hey, if you want to reach out to us on social media and let us know how to pronounce your hometown so that we know for, you know, advanced episodes, we would say yes to that. Well, in a, a cool development that we have at this point as the audience 
it's you know the you good people that are listening as that number's grown is uh, having basically just having resources i mean i i can get on the facebook group at this point and that just seems to be the best response i've tried it on twitter i've tried it on patreon and, and whatnot and we get good responses on on all the platforms yeah but facebook is our facebook's like instantaneous yeah. Yeah, so we can be in the midst of recording even if something's eluded us and I'll post on there, ooh, how how do I save this river? Boom, out comes someone from Georgia. Yeah, that's 10 minutes from my house. This is how it's said. Yeah. It's so helpful. It's so awesome. Oh, yes. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you to all of you who are doing that. And well, you know, well, while we're there, I mean, I guess it kind of falls even within the corrections, you could say. We already did a whole bonus episode on it. But I mean, thanks again to Lucy. Thanks uh, to Jeremy who did the, uh, the accents episode uh, with me. Um, you know, I also, there's no, one, there's no name I can ascribe to this. I'll also just say thanks to a whole lot of uh, Southerners who then wrote afterward and said, Hey, we actually really dig what you do. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, and th- that, that was really kind of appreciated uh, that there was some real outpouring of, of love. And, uh, so thank you. Uh, thanks for all that. And while we're kind of in thanks mode, there are a few others. Yeah. Like so, a uh, uh- Big, big, big thanks to uh, Mike Ercolini. Absolutely. In Boston. Mike, oh, boy. Who, uh, <laughs> I mean, you lived in Boston, right, Greg? So I you, did. You have a little bit of a grasp on the Boston accent. but we I know how to this... pack my car. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, but... I don't. So... <laughs> well, but I was actually more nervous about because it it's one thing to be like, yeah, I botched, you know, the Georgian accent. I've never been to Georgia, right? Sure. When you've lived in Boston, though, there's a little like I, I have a few friends who definitely call me afterward and be like, you know, yeah, get it together. So anyway, Mike, Mike walked us through it. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. big so help. The uh, that that was the open where we had the peace negotiations going on with uh, Jefferson Davis mm-hmm. and uh, James Gilmore. He's a Bostonian, and Mike literally was on the phone with me through it. I I would uh, you know he he'd see the he had the script in front of him too, he'd read it to to me. <laughs> yeah. I'd mute him. I'd read it out. It was a real fun experience. I really appreciated that. Yeah. So and you know to what extent that will be duplicated on some other stuff, we'll we'll see. But this is all part of just thank you all the people who are listening and who are willing to volunteer their their, their time and talents. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so it's it's really cool. And I did not have to get any. Uh, any emails from old friends in Boston. So that's yeah. nice. <laughs> um, and then I also just want to say thanks to Christy out in Georgia, who amidst the COVIDness going on, she made us masks. And so cool. And they're freaking awesome. Mm-hmm. They're amazing. They're high quality. They're cool. Yeah. So, so thoughtful. Yeah. Just thank you. That yeah. was really awesome. Very kind. Okay. So, corrections and thanks. Let's have some. Let's talk civil war. Let's talk civil war. We haven't done enough of that in the last year, <laughs> year of our <laughs> lives. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so let's start with causes of the civil war. Yes. One last One time. last time. Let's talk what started this whole thing. So as we were going through this, Greg and I are discussing, okay, where do we talk about the civil war causes, right? And I was like, well. And to be efficient on this, because that could be like a two-hour it, oh, and we're not doing that no, right we're now. Not. That is not happening. But, you know, if you decided as a listener, you wanted a refresher on causes of the Civil War, you wanted to go back and listen to some episodes, we recommend listening to episodes uh, <clears throat> 2 through 45. Yeah, that should do it. <laughs> that should do it. Okay, so tongue and cheek aside, we were talking about when did we first get something that connects to the Civil War. Mm-hmm. And that, it's in episode two, where James Otis is writing a pamphlet it, you know, we're talking about colonial taxation. Right. And in that pamphlet, as some of you might recall, perhaps if you've listened to number two recently for whatever reason, if you haven't in a long time, by all means, go, go back, back, give it a re-listen. And I did uh, th- mention um, that James has a part in this pamphlet where as he's talking about colonial rights and taxes and whatnot, he kind of has his own little aside. Where it's just a page or so. But he says, hey, by the way, black colonists are equal to white colonists. Right. We are all British subjects. We all have these rights. Or at least he's saying maybe that doesn't equal the actual political reality. But he's that's asserting. That's his argument. Yeah, that's how it should be. So while we're reassessing what the, you know, what civil rights, what political rights, human rights, what, you know, whichever form of rights you want to go with, 
uh, people have. He is making this argument in the 1760s. Let's get color out of the picture. Yeah. And uh, obviously he is, um, he's very much not in sync with what a lot of other people are thinking at that same time. Sure. Yeah, but, he, he's, a, he's an extreme view. But the view is is out there. And that that's, I guess, what we, you know, where, yeah, so, where, where we would go back to episode two and say, you can already see the wheels are turning. Mm-hmm. The, the discourse is in play. Right, right. Yeah, people are already discussing it. So, um, so really, you can start at episode two, but you really don't need to. Really, if you want to start talking uh, causes of the Civil War, go post-Mexican-American War. And that's when we'll start getting debates about the expansion of slavery into this new territory that we've gained from this war and the debates over... Um, you know, is it okay to curtail slavery's expansion? What does that mean for current slave states? Then you start getting debates where uh, you have the Whig Party falling apart and the rise of the Republican Party and, and the, the platforms that they stand for. Obviously, there's our major causes, right? Expansion of slavery becomes yeah. a, a major issue, which then affects how people see, okay, if we can't expand it, are you guys saying we should shrink it? Does that mean we're going to lose slavery in the states that already have it? Um, and then you do get some ideas from that of, okay, does a state have a right to secede if they don't like the majority viewpoint yeah. that is from the northern and western territories and states? Well, that idea had not been, it just it hadn't been tested. It no, hadn't it hadn't been, been. It hadn't been pressed. Sure. And there is there is space for that intellectual argument before the Civil War. Uh, if we remember going all the way back, and this is again kind of to our joking, go to episode two. I mean, go to the early yeah. episodes where we've got to remember that the colony saw themselves as they became states as independent sovereign states. Is why sure. they use that word. It's, you know, the rest of the, I, I had a professor in my PhD program. He was, he was an Oxford type and, you know, that's where he graduated from. And mm -hmm. of course, had to make sure we all knew that. Sure. That's an inferior student. But <laughs> no, he was actually a really nice guy. But uh, Oxford managed to make it into, I think, every other lecture at the very least. And sure. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, he, w there was one time uh, the, the course was on Iraq and uh, he used the term state and he kind of paused, goes, oh, now let me make sure you Americans understand how the word state actually is used. Uh, yeah. And, you know, kind of goes off on his little side tangent about, you know, that a state is an independent sovereign nation. Sure. Um, and, you know, so that's, we use that term in the United States because that's that's what they were originally. And yeah, that's what they saw themselves as. Well, and you see those discussions even after the Constitution is ratified when you have the debate over who's going to pay the debts of the Revolutionary War. And some people are arguing, hey, the federal government should come in and they should help and we should all collectively pay one another's debts. And some states are like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Right. Right, because they still see themselves as a state first. So by the time you get to the 1850s, that idea still exists. And well, now it's time to say, okay, and can we leave? And uh, you know, the what was created was not a centralized government. I think that's also important to remember. And sure. something I would I would even argue that some Americans lose sight of today because we live in a post Civil War world. No one's alive who lived previous to the Civil War, and there is something of an inclination. I don't know. I, I I've been to some town hall meetings and and such in, in my time where uh, I've listened to my representative. I mean, kindly, you know, always trying to be kind yeah. with with, with uh, voters, uh, explain that the issue that the uh, citizen is bringing up has nothing to do with what he does in D.C. That's actually an issue for your state representative. And I, I remember this one moment it just really sticks with me. It was just lost on this person. Sure. A and my my rep ended up pointing out that my, my state rep was also in the room mm -hmm. saying, you need to talk to him. He handles that. That is a that is a state issue. So I do federal. This is state, and so I, I do think. I mean, this is a well-meaning, engaged citizen, right? Right. They're at a town hall meeting, right? So if you know, if if we have um, people that are you know that engaged who don't always grasp the delineation between federal and state, this is you know th that's just my take. I, I really do think that we lose sight that American federalism was this design to share sovereignty and it, ever. Ever since, I mean, it's a, bril a brilliant design, I think, but 
ever since its inception. And the Civil War kind of settled some issues. Yes. But even still, after the Civil War, America has always been fighting over what that balance is, how much mm-hmm. sovereignty still remains at the state level. Right. And how much has been transferred to the federal level. And 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 should we be shifting that to one right. side or the other? Yeah. And have we overdone it one way or have we underdone it? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I mean, for me... Uh, to be super nerdy for a second, that was part of the the fascinating and, and enjoyable th- thing as we were building up to the Civil War was seeing the the nuanced different views in uh, various American leaders, such as Andrew Jackson, who's a staunch unionist, but he still has a pretty like yeah yeah he's he's not interested in a federal bank. <laughs> no, yeah. So so you see these these very by our standards today curious amalgamations of mm-hmm. of the two. Mm-hmm. So I've gone yeah, on too long. Well, and you see the debates. Part. Yeah, you just see, you see the debates in Congress in the 1850s over what can the federal government do in a territory right. versus what the people in a territory can do, and they, they, obviously they and, get incredibly heated. Well, and, and they're not sure. I mean, no, in some not. ways, it gets back to if you think about George Washington's presidency. The the thing I felt the most for George Washington on is the. The guy was flying by the seat of his pants. There's no precedent, right? And there's no precedent for these people. Exactly. And and just as you saw, if you remember all the way back to say episode 16, Founding Fractures, right? Where we really, that was an episode where we happened to really have some fights, right? And hence the name between uh, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, right? That is the epitome of that friction still at play. Even if some big questions have been settled, still at play and new questions are, arise all the time is there's new technological advancements, right? I mean, you, you didn't have to think about cars <laughs> right, 200 yeah. years ago yeah. or, 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 you know, there's so, so many other things, but. Sure, sure. Yeah. Anyhow, sorry, I could get philosophical on this all day long. Just shut me up, so. <laughs> yeah, Greg, stop talking. I'm sorry. Gosh. That's okay. So um, that's, you know, those are our, our main causes. Yes, but so, so, I mean, slavery though, that. Slavery. Uh, I, I see while these other things are circling around it, slavery is the big crux. Well, that's... slavery is the issue that everyone's talking about. Where does the federal government authority end and where right. does state authority begin over the issue of slavery? Yeah. yeah. No, no one in territories or, you know, Kansas to be specific, is being shot over whether or not they have the right to elect a territorial governor or the federal government has the right to appoint one. Yeah. They're fighting over slavery. Well, and uh, I don't remember the episode number off the top of my head, but we have these discussions so, so much, CL, right? Where I say, hey, I mean, obviously I already knew it on this level, but wow, writing this episode, it went so much deeper for me. And I feel so much, you know, closer to it and enriched. Uh, the Lincoln Douglas debates. Yes. You know, going through that material. Here you have two men going at it for the seat uh, to be a a senator representing the great state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And debate after debate, hours and hours on end, really, it's one subject. It's slavery. Over and over again. Yes, it's slavery. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you know, if if you've never read through, obviously, I I quoted a lot Mm -hmm. as we went through it. I it's at least worth a re-listen if you're thinking about causes of the Civil War. Yeah. Uh, or frankly, even pulling up the transcripts from those debates. I mean, it's yeah, it's, I, it was really powerful for me going, oh my gosh. Well, and what what's so great about those debates is it's two really smart people from different sides of the issue talking about, yeah. okay, what are the political issues of slavery? Yeah. And you get the two, you get the two main sides. Of that debate. Well, and I, I like the, the point you just made. They're both intelligent, right? So mm-hmm. y- you don't just get... You don't get somebody just spouting off their opinion. You don't get exactly. lazy. You get really well thought out arguments that represent the arguments that were being made all across the country. And and they're basing it on the U.S. code. They're basing it on the Constitution. I mean, th- these are... Yeah, legal these are, precedent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So one of the reasons that I think some people get, well, was slavery really a cause of the war? What, you know, is we get this lost cause narrative that shows up after the war. And it's perpetuated yes. by people like, not not just, but by people like Jefferson Davis, who look at the Civil War, for, you know, in hindsight mm-hmm. and say, well, we never could have won. And it was never really about slavery. And, you know free speech. <laughs> they can write what they want. And their ideas really 
um, th- I think they bring a lot of comfort to war veterans. I think so. And they really grab hold in the South. And in fact, even all the way up until uh, the late 20th century with the amazing historian Shelby Foote, even his research has a lost cause bent, if you will. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean... Okay, I, I think Shelby Foote's done great work. Oh, no, I think he's done great work. His but three volumes are like, it, it, required reading if you want to consider yourself a Civil War scholar. But yes, I... Yeah, but, you know, when you talk like uh, a more modern historian, a more yeah. modern Civil War historian like a Gary Gallagher or a James, James McPherson, McPherson. Yeah. They, they've really yeah. cleaned the... They've got it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that out, so... And something that historians grapple with all the time is the disconnect that you'll find if you're reading, this could be the same person, right? So a primary source, a source written by someone who experienced the historical event, Mm -hmm. right? But you might be right. You might be reading their journal as the events transpiring. And then you read the account they wrote in their memoirs 25 years later. Sure. And it doesn't line up. And, and here's the important thing. And, um, I'm not calling any historical figure a liar. That's not my intention. I think they genuinely, most of the time, they genuinely mean well, but you, your memory's faded. Mm-hmm. You have the advantage of hindsight. Right. And you genuinely will start to convince yourself your that you pers- had, yes, your perspective just shifted, right? Yeah, your perspective has changed. Whether you've convinced yourself of something that was or your perspective on what was has changed. You know, mm-hmm. Grant's memoirs show the same thing. Right. Right. And that doesn't mean we dismiss. I'm not saying that a source, obviously, this is still the person who lived through it. Right. Right. And, and sometimes that's all you have. It's not like everyone keeps a day to day journal. Sure. Uh, but yeah, but we, we see this same thing play out. Mm-hmm. So you'll get different versions of the same event recorded by the same person. It doesn't mean that they are malicious or trying to misrepresent. Yeah. It doesn't mean they're selling. I mean, very occasionally they could sure. be. But, but by and large, it means they're human. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, so that's one of the reasons I think that slavery as a cause of the Civil War in the decades after, right after the Civil War gets downplayed. Yeah. And it, to some degree, I mean, I guess we kind of don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole because we're going to do Reconstruction. Yes, we are. So, <laughs> you know, we'll just maybe call that like teaser. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tune in next time. Right. Uh, but yeah, as, as you go through, you, you can see, okay, so that's how this narrative g- took hold. And, you know, I, I think returning to where you started with that, CL, it, it's pretty comforting to the amputee who's trying to make sense of what in the world just, just happened. happened. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. So. So some of the other issues that are at play uh, in the Civil War, right? So we've gone from, you know, a, an issue that causes it and then is at play during it, which is slavery. But an issue that continues to play out during the Civil War in the North and the South is racial equality which we explored a lot in our episode on black soldiers. Yeah. So that you have, you know, white soldiers in the North (laughs) being like, I'm not going to fight with those guys. I think this is one thing that, well, I mean, there's so many things, but if there are a few highlights that I, I would like people to better recollect and understand about the civil war, I think we're very quick to fall into a pattern of the kind of the, the and I, this is not any sort of uh, apology for the CSA, but the righteous North and the, the villainous South. And in that narrative, we forget how much racism there was in the North. And yes. that's kind of a nervous laugh there, by the way. I mean, some of the, the Northern soldiers journals that we read it. I, I mean, we, we couldn't use them in the scripts. They're so. They're so negative. They're Some of so them. they're so racist. No, not in a hide, uh, you know. No, I mean we obviously we used them. Yeah, but they're they're so. We bleeped them. Yeah, we did because yeah. they're blatantly racist. They're yeah. pretty uncomfortable to read. Um, and you know the other thing we forget is that northern states had slavery, and in some states, they had you know gradually abolished it. But by the time yep. the Civil War starts, there's still a handful of enslaved Black Americans in the North. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They're really old. Right? Yeah. But, you know, we forget that when we try to oversimplify and say, oh, well, the North was the good guys. Right. And good guys couldn't possibly have racial tension. When the New York draft riots and uh, recruiting black soldiers clearly disproves that. This is so, um, I'm, I might be kind of jumping ahead in terms of our organization, but I feel That's like fine. it fits. We're going to do this. Um, was it 
Oh, dang. It was one of our patrons who asked the question. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the question was, and if you see the name, <laughs> remind me, but uh, the, the question was basically why would poor Southern soldiers sign up to fight when with slavery being, you know, such a the major you know, cause of the civil war right. when they don't own slaves. And um, I think th this here illustrates, you know, you, you have Northerners who are, are fighting. They might not necessarily agree with what the war aims are as the North shifts. Initially, it is only about preserving the union. Right. But as it adds a dual war aim of ending slavery with the emancipation proclamation, um, you know, it's, we seem to have grasped this from Vietnam on, but I think we sometimes fail to apply this to earlier wars, that soldiers don't soldier for the official reasons. Right. You know, it's it's not like you have an army that's 100% made up of people who go, yes, I agree with the current administration and the war aims. I mean, it's, yes. it's bounties. I can't feed my family. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. yeah. It's people who are wealthy enough to uh, pay someone to sign up for them yep yeah so and so and we have that on both sides and we have conscription on both sides mm -hmm. so you have soldiers out there who genuinely don't want to be fighting they don't believe in north or south right in the cause right they're they're fighting because they've been pressed into yeah. to the war but um specifically to our patrons question which was why would the southerners fight if they didn't you know, benefit from slavery. Oh, yeah, sure. Yes. Right? You can see where I was connecting, yeah, right? Yeah, just yeah. that there's a myriad of, of reasons, but yeah. Right. So specifically it. to that, so I think you need to just back up just a little bit back to secession. Mm -hmm. If you look at the people who attend the South Carolina Secession Con Convention in December of 1860, which is our first secession convention, uh, they are entirely to, to a man, to a white man, Property owning, slave owning, top 10% wealth men. They are not the everyday farmer or blacksmith who might own a blacksmith shop and maybe five acres on which he gardens to support his family. Right. They are not people who own 50 acre farms, very much subsistence living. And that's shown when you have people who really resist the CSA, the Free State of Jones, which we covered. Right. Um, the the bread riots again. The draft riots. We'll bring those up again, right? Um, yeah. Because well, though ag again, they remember didn't the vote the, to secede. The, the draft riots, not to take away from your excellent and accurate point. No, those are northern, but, but that's in the north. Which again, though, just shows this idea, right? That the north. I'm not trying to crap on the north here. It's just that's the 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 thing that usually needs to kind of be corrected, right? Mm -hmm. Is you know, so here you have um, white, uh, largely immigrant. Uh, Poor, poor. You know the New York's poor who are are seeing this potential shift in which they are they're fearful as uncomfortable as this is to discuss, right? But they're fearful that basically e emancipated Black Americans are going to be able to equate them on the, the 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 social ladder, yeah. And they're terrified at losing what little power, what little political power or economic foothold they have in these little hovels they live in, in, in right. these, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the same thing is happening in the South. Right. Right. Um, right. That people, yeah, this is where yeah, it connects. Yeah. The, the poor whites in the South fear racial equality. Yeah. It, they're, they're not on board with it at all. And of course, these are all general, uh, you know, generalizations, right? We're talking sure. about again, large free swaths. state of Jones d would right. not would not stand up to those arguments. Uh, yep. He did not fear uh, racial equality. Yeah. Um. But but mostly, right? But yeah. Mostly, um, most Americans, North and South, do. Yeah. So you see that play out in in a lot of different ways. Um. On and off the battlefield. Right. Well, <laughs> that, was <laughs> that was some heavy stuff there. But uh, all that's crucial to understanding how we got to the Civil War. Mm -hmm, and once once that, uh, you know, Chris Caldwell, he laid this out pretty well in the bonus episode we did. Mm -hmm. Once it got to that teetering point where it was clear that s slavery as an economic system was never going to have viable power in Congress and would be able to be... Uh, eliminated by the other states 
as states are added to the union, as that right. expansion continues. You know, that's where even though Abraham Lincoln's elected saying, I'm not going to touch slavery where it's at, right? Just, just don't want to see it expand. But I understand it is a constitutionally protected institution to be executed at the state level if a state so wishes. Right. Yeah. Th these are his arguments in 1860. He's yeah. like, I do not have the constitutional authority to end slavery in a state. And uh, I mean, as, as I understand the constitution, he's right. Like, he that, that's not Lincoln sidestepping. I mean, he's... He doesn't. It, <laughs> yeah. That's... If you remember all the way back to episode 15, we, where we talked about, mm -hmm. you know, the devil's bargain, if you will, South Carolina, uh, I, I believe uh, above and beyond any other, but Georgia right behind it, mm -hmm. those delegates were ready to walk if slavery, uh, if the Constitution had any power to touch a state's ability to continue slavery. Right, right. So in 1860, those states are still feeling threatened. And when Lincoln is um, elected, they're like, yeah, you say that, but we don't believe you. And so they yeah. they decide to well, secede. And because at this point, right, that the balance was in their favor. I think you see that reflected in who are uh, becoming uh, Supreme Court justices, right. are early presidents, mm -hmm. vastly, by and large, elite Southerners. Yes. And it's at this point that things have shifted. The, the population has shifted. There's a, in terms of how populous the North is, the addition of, of other states. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, for lack of a better word, I'll use it again, the, that devil's bargain that pieced together the the 13 original states, it's it's collapsed by 1860, despite yeah. the Missouri Compromise of, of 1820, despite you know the Compromise of 1850, mm -hmm. the Nebraska <laughs> yeah. 1854, uh, despite the band aids. Yes, all the <laughs> the band aids, duct tape, bubble gum, and super glue that they've been using to somehow try and skirt slavery. Mm -hmm. It's it's just come crashing down. Yeah, yeah, and so what you have is you have states who finally decide to test that. Uh, to test the Constitution. Right. Can we secede? Can we secede? We are states after all, right? Yeah. We entered this as independent sovereign states to circle so, back to my Oxford professor. Right. And so what you end up with is you end up with, well, we'll just secede. See you later. Thanks so much. This has been fun. Yep. And we're out. And so you can also see this is where, you know, we get, um, you know, it, it's not entirely wrong to talk about states' rights within the Civil War, what is wrong is to have that narrative and pretend that the, the state right that was being debated was the state's right to practice slavery. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's where they can get a little convoluted, but it's yeah. important to keep both. Yeah. Yeah. To keep in mind the full, the full extent of the argument. Well, and I think it's important because you don't understand the close of the Civil War and the shift in the American, in, in American, uh, what, uh, the American perspective mm -hmm. in, in terms of really coming to to view ourselves as Americans first, instead of seeing ourselves as Virginians or Connecticuters. I just love that word. I know. You know, <laughs> Georgians, uh, New Yorkers, right? That that shift of of the state um, identity, yeah, taking the back seat to being American, right? You know, that's a really good transition into this idea because we did have a lot of people ask us. How did people choose sides after secession has yes. happened, right? Where do their loyalties lie? What are the reasons for the for them choosing to go with their state and secede or stay with the union? Yeah. You know, um, and, and it's really interesting. You have Southerners a lot yep. who stay with the union. You have Northerners who join the Confederacy. You do. It's <laughs> It's very interesting to watch these loyalties and watch this really difficult decision Honestly, for a lot of these people. I, I mean, th for me, this is one of the most fascinating things about going through this past year mm -hmm. was was seeing this. Because, okay, so uh, we, we've laid out the official state uh, arguments, right, for wh why we're going to war. Mm -hmm. It basically it boils down to slavery. And so now exercising what is being argued in, in these soon-to-be Confederate states that they have a state right to withdraw from the the union mm -hmm. as the sovereign states that they were when they entered it. Um, and while the Confederate States of America, at the end of the day, it is about perpetuating the institution of slavery. Yes. Right. So there's no dressing what this 
what the CSA, you know. Yeah, there's very little difference between is. the U.S. Constitution and the CS Constitution. The only, the biggest difference is that they explicitly say that slavery is protected. Right. Whereas, Whereas the Constitution uses all kinds of. Well, the word slavery is never used, it, yeah. although it's addressed a number of times. Yeah. 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 But the word slavery is not used. The word slavery is used in the CS Constitution. Right. So all that to say, you have people who then have to choose. You know, they've, yeah. you know, you've got the Winfield Scots, right, who've been in the United States Army. Forever. Literally, like, like their whole lives, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure he joined at birth, didn't he? Pretty much, pretty much. Uh, yeah, and so... But he's Virginian, so... So for him, though... He chooses it's union. He chooses union. And that's where, you know, early on, we there's that discussion as well with Robert E. Lee. Yes. Right? And there's a real earnest hope and belief in the North, you know, in the, the, the Union. I, I guess for some s- smaller clarification, sure. right? Within the United States, the non-seceding states, that Robert is gonna stick with with the US. Yeah, and, and there's some I you know it, it did it happen? Did it not happen? But there's there's a story out there that Winfield Scott says, you know, it extends a job offer to Bobby Lee. And Bobby yeah. Lee says to him, I you know, can't take this. I'm actually going to secede. I'm going to go with Virginia. Right. And Winfield Scott says, you're making the biggest mistake. You know, whether or not yeah, is that it? actually happened, it's a little debatable. But the idea, the idea is sound uh, yeah. that there is debate. Will you stay or not? Should you stay or not? There, You know, so Bobby Lee leaves and he, Obviously, he joins the Confederacy, he stays with Virginia, stays with his home state. But there's another Virginian, George Thomas, yep. who stays with the Union, loses his family over he it. He pays a hefty price. He does. For sticking with the Union. Yeah. A hefty personal price. Yes, is, a hefty is, personal is, price. Yeah, yeah, to be clear. Uh, yeah, career-wise, he's, well, he's and, fine. And but. this is, I think, something that, Ed, um, that, again, I think people lose sight of when we don't keep a historical perspective is... And it's it seems so clear and vivid in the 21st century to say, I mean, the CSA is basically looking to enslave people. Yeah. The the personal, um, we all want to think that we are the that moral person who's always going to choose the the right, you know. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that anyone should have you know, some sort of sympathy or whatever. Uh, I, I'm not here to tell you how to view it, but to to recognize that someone like Robert E. Lee, uh, who's the the poster child, I guess, right? The the the, the clearest image here. Um, he, he says, even though at the end of the day, it boils down to when he fights for the CSA, he is going to be perpetuating slavery, right? Like right. that's what it will become. Yes. His personal reason is that he's not willing to raise the sword against his, what he sees as his... His family. Yeah. His home state. He's not willing to do it. It's a complicated decision. There's a lot that goes into it. And you can see that in most of the decisions. Yep. Um, you can see it in um, Stonewall Jackson as well, right? I was genuinely floored at some of the things I read, um, I mean, his correspondence. Right. There was an instance, geez, I wish I could remember it verbatim. I mean, this is like a year ago. It was early on in the Civil War. He wrote something to the effect of um, <laughs> kind of acknowledging the moral superiority of the Union. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, he's not willing to, to fight. fight against Virginia. Yeah. 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 So ex- then you see people like um, William Tecumseh Sherman, who actually at the start of the Civil War has <laughs> just started a job in Louisiana yeah. as an instructor at a new military institute. Literally, he's been there for like four months when the war breaks out. What does he do? He's like, um, see you later, guys. Peace Going out. Home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he goes and he, yeah. he goes and he joins the Union Army and he goes and checks out his family and makes sure that they're all good to go. When he has equally complicated decisions on both sides of, you know, what's he going to choose and which right. side should he go with? I mean, that can't be comfortable to be living in, in the deep South, yeah. right? I mean, come on, Robert E. Lee's a stone's throw from D.C. Sure. In the in the big scheme of things, right? Yes. Half of his home state is going to secede from the seceded state. Right. <laughs> so, and I get it though, at, at the same time, he has deep history as opposed to William Tecumseh Sherman, who has been there for a hot minute. Yeah. But nonetheless, I mean, you've moved to a place, right? Like you're building your life here. 
And, and suddenly <laughs> you got to decide, are you going to bounce or are you going to really saddle up for something you did not intend? You know, right. Th- that's an uncomfortable and difficult decision. And these are the uncomfortable, difficult decisions that Americans are making across the North and South. Mm-hmm. And undoubtedly, you know, you, you do have the the large plantations with hundreds of human beings enslaved and those people hands down are wanting the CSA specifically for the reason that we find in the documents in which secession happened. I mean, it's clear as day, right? I mean, there's no, if you read those documents, they say straight up. I I want my uh, human uh, property protected. Thank you. Exactly. Slavery. Uh, And then, you know, there, there's the many grades though of other personal reasons why people ultimately fight for one or the other. Right. Right, which Um, sides they choose. We've talked a lot about, you know, people who choose the North versus the South, but there is this interesting, um, the Battle of Vicksburg, John Pemberton, who should not be confused with the John Pemberton who invents Coca-Cola, just so we're all clear. Totally got to. Just going to leave that teaser. (laughs) (laughs) But but John Pemberton, he's born in the North. He's, He's from the North. But he yeah, marries, yeah, he marries a Southerner and he is a Confederate commander. He gets a lot of flack for being the Confederate commander that loses Vicksburg as a Northerner. That does not go well yeah. for him. <laughs> well, and that's where you, you do have these really awkward relationships. Because at the same time, um, David Farragut. Yes. Southern as Southern gets. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's lived in several, born in the South. Eh raised-ish in the South. On a it, ship, but it, yes, yeah, in the South. <laughs> you know, raised in the South until he's like nine. And, <laughs> and then he lives on the, the ocean. Navy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this prepubescent uh, Navy man. Yeah, right. <laughs> Navy know. boy. He, um, and no, there's a lot of doubt. He is Southern. He's married to a Southerner. His mm-hmm. father was a Southerner. Mm-hmm. His adoptive father was a Southerner. Mm-hmm. So right at the beginning, and that's got to be another point of friction too. Can you imagine being a Southern who's saying, hey, yeah, I'm going to stay loyal to the Union. I am going to forsake, you know, my friends and family and stick with the Union. And at the end of the day, they're then greeted with, well, but really, can we really really trust you? Well, and you know, George Thomas faces some of that in the War Department. He doesn't get as, he doesn't climb as high as you think he would, as fast as you would think he would, based on his yeah, performance the on the field. Yeah, come on. Yeah, because he's Virginian. Yeah. And no, people are like, eh, can we really trust this guy with war secrets? Seems right. like maybe we shouldn't. Um, he really has to prove himself. So. Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting to see all of the different sides that people do. But I, I will say, and I know this is a huge throwback, going all the way back to episode 50, very beginning of the war, really, Battle of uh, New Orleans, for me, and you know, as as we've discussed, as I mentioned in the accents episode, it was part of where I leaned into these different accents, trying to help people see, like, mm-hmm. look at who these people are, right. right? Like, so you had Johnson K. Duncan, a Northerner, right, defending Fort Jackson, which is one of the primary, I mean, main defense, uh, you know, batteries, uh, fortresses protecting the Crescent City. Mm-hmm. And here's David Farragut, who, amidst his bouncing around as a young man, um, you know, from what Tennessee to mm-hmm. Louisiana mm-hmm. to Virginia, he's lived here, right? I mean, for me, I sat there thinking, like, what would it be like to lead a military force into my, you know, my child hometown in Southern California? Yeah, you know, right? what's that? Guy? And for him, there, I never caught any inclination of like, man, I've this is awkward. This is, I have doubts about what I'm doing. He was a hundred percent. Yeah. All the way. This man is union through and through. Right. Right. Well, and you know, you can kind of see where he's coming from a little bit. I mean, I'm going to put words in his mouth. Right. You know, maybe he's thinking, uh, this is, this has been the union since my childhood and I want it to stay union. Right. I'm not going to let these, uh, these usurpers Mm -hmm. steal my home from the union. Right. Sure. Right. But yeah, it's it is so complicated, right? It is. And it's I, so complicated. So I mean, when I think about people that I really respect as as I come through all of this and you know, I and try to take as human a view as I can of everyone, but it's guys like David Farragut mm-hmm. above and beyond who I really, you know, George Thomas. Yeah. These guys who truly more than took it on the chin, you know, they 
sacrifice their personal lives saying, I'm sticking with the United States. Right, right. It's this. It's the decision, like, when I think about it, I think, I would love to think I would make that decision. Getting back to my earlier point, right? Like, we can't know it's that. who you want to think. say <laughs> and think and believe down to your soul that you are. Right. And you really hope yeah. you are. Right. You know? And these... And they were. And they had, I would say, the unfortunate uh, position of being able to be tested to that sure. point. Sure. I mean, I don't, I don't, um, if we're really honest with ourselves, does anyone really aspire to be tested on that level? No. I, th- I think some people might go, oh, no, totally, because I know I'd pass it. Mm. I think that's a really hard thing. Right. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. Okay. Have we talked enough about uh, some of the big the big players and the sides they, they picked? And oh, whatnot? I think so. I think so, I think, too. So. I think okay. we should do something more fun and talk about uh, the things that people shot during the war. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's always a big hit. Let's... <laughs> Well, let's be real. Okay, so I think I should just put this, like, just get this out of the way. Actually, CL, can, can I just say really quickly, why don't we go ahead and just take a quick break? Yes. Assuming we have an ad to run currently. So let's take a quick break, and we'll come back and blow things up. Let's do it. And we're probably, ba- I hope probably back because uh, otherwise we're probably running out of deficit. Yeah. Patreon.com <laughs> forward slash history that doesn't suck. Okay, so changing, uh, yeah, the, the military tactics. Yeah, let's, let's, talk, let's talk military about. tactics and tech. So I think it's important that people know I am not a military historian. What? I, I don't profess to be one. Yeah, you were uh, so into, I can't I even say that with a straight face. No, no, you can't. It's true. Um, I uh, learned a lot about military organization and weaponry um, during this last year. Is, is a, it? A lot. <laughs> okay, I, I hope this doesn't embarrass you. Can I just share one thing? Yeah. All the way back to the War of 1812. That That's when you were starting to write some of the scripts, right? Right, right. I think that's when it was. I, I will never forget, though, when you asked me, what is Grape Shot? What is Grape Shot? Yeah. I, I did not know. And, I genuinely hey, did. Look at how much you know today, though. You do circles around self-professed, uh, amateur military historians. Sure. You know? Sure. Like you yes. would school them. Yeah. No, I mean, I definitely know the difference between a regiment and a battalion now. Definitely. Was that okay? Is that all right? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I right. didn't know what Grape Shot was. I didn't. I'd read the term. I'd sure. heard it. You know, but I'm like, so Sounded more means... delicious than anything, but it was yeah. actually not. <laughs> what are we talking about here? Yeah. So, yeah. So, when it comes to writing up the transition from ball ammunition to bullet ammunition, mm-hmm. you know, that's something that we got to talk about all the time. And it's really interesting. And now I understand it. Right. Yay. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, let's talk about the shift from musket to freaking repeating rifle. Huh? Yeah. Right. Holy crap. This it makes things so much deadlier. See, I'll take it away. Oh, no. I mean, it does. It makes it makes the Civil War so much deadlier because you go from muskets, super inaccurate, which we talked about in right. the Revolution. Which, to be clear, if anyone's forgotten, it means it's not rifled, which if you look down the barrel of a gun and please make sure it's not loaded and that the safety is on if you do something like that, mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. Uh, you'll see grooves, little, little circles. Or if you've ever watched a James Bond movie, 007, that opening sequence, you can see the, the gun that falls. Yeah, you see yeah. those little swirly lines. Right. Yeah. That's what makes it go straight. It puts that spin like a spiral, like a football being thrown on it. Right. So M- muskets don't have that. No, they don't. So the majority of soldiers in the Civil War are firing rifles. And by yes. the middle of the Civil War, which we talked about when we talked about the Battle of Chickamauga, yeah. um, they have repeater rifles, which fire seven bullets. Well, they have a repeater that has yeah. seven bullets in it. Um, so it's no longer, let me load down the muzzle one Mm-hmm. One bullet at a time. Right, right. And actually, there are soldiers who describe when they're firing these guns just how destructive they are. The, these soldiers are blown away at the the destruction that can be yeah. wreaked by these guns. Uh, funny aside that didn't end up in the script is that the repeater rifles are, you know, they're not perfect. It's it's new technology. It's going to have some glitches, right? Right. Uh, you know, today we would call it it's in beta. Uh, <laughs> exactly. They overheat. And on the battlefield, that's a problem. So you mm-hmm. have some stories of soldiers who figure out creative ways 
to uh, cool off their guns. Indeed. By peeing on them. <laughs> That's right. Hey, you, you do what you got to do. You do what you have to do, right? You've got a battle to win. And General George Thomas told you to hold your ground. And let's be honest, when they do that, then pick up that gun again, it's not the dirtiest thing they've laid their hands on. No, it is not. By a long shot. No. <laughs> so, okay, very quick aside, to take us to uh, Brussels, if you will. Are you familiar with the uh, statue of um, the, the, the the small boy? It's famous in, yes. in Brussels, right? He's, he's peeing mm-hmm, in yeah. the fountain. So the lore, because of course, no one actually knows where this fountain came from. Like the, the authentic history is lost. The, this thing's hundreds of years old. Right, right. And it's been copied more times than anybody knows. Yeah, precisely. But the lore is that during a siege, like 1100s or something like that, a lit bomb is launched over the walls into Brussels. Everyone, you know, we're going to die. This is it. And a quick thinking boy ran up and took care of business. Sure. On the bomb and everything was okay. I like that story. <laughs> I think we should just go ahead and just say it's true. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if we weren't proper historians, <laughs> we would do that. We could. We would do that, but... We'll have to just go ahead and say that's awesome lore that I super hope is true. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. That's, that's an awesome leaving, story. leaving Europe, back to the American Civil War. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I just try and think, you know, for, I guess if you're a really young listener, maybe this one won't, won't resonate, but remember when smartphones came out? Yeah. That changed our lives it is a different world for those of us who remember the analog days of the 90s and the 80s, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to go from guns that you have to load every single shot to suddenly just being able to crank out seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it changes war. So the thing that you see is you see not only does it change how how many people you can kill. It changes the <sighs> tactic, right? Because generals start to go, oh my gosh, I can't just leave my men on the field to be slaughtered. Yeah. We, we can't do that anymore. And so you have a change in tactics that tries to catch up to, I won't say meets, tries to catch up to the change in uh, technology. Yeah. So, I mean, because at the beginning of the war, I mean, there are still a handful, I don't know the percentage, but you still got some muskets out there. Some, yeah. So, uh, you know, think about this. If you were to go back to the revolution, Muskets inaccurate. They're basically firing a ball that's like a knuckleball. If you know your baseball, apparently I'm just gonna sport, you know, <laughs> metaphor the crap out of guns. I probably living up to some stereotypes about a Western American right now. Sure, but but uh, to go from that to um, we've got the minier ball. Mm-hmm. Think, th- thanks French for figuring out how to make make guns w- more deadly. Yep. You know, so now now bullets are pointed. They enter. Uh, well, better. <laughs> they're they're better at penetrating their target. Yeah, they're better at penetrating human flesh. And and uh, you know the whole rifled thing, the repeating. Uh, this is this is really deadly. Before you could stand across from someone firing a musket. I mean, think about the duels we talked about, right? right. Why did so many people survive these duels? They they were, they were good f- shots. If they were firing crappy guns. <laughs> exactly. So even if they were good at what they did, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, think about John Calderwater all the way back to the Revolution. We described. Uh, him um, shooting uh, in his duel. Oh my gosh, I just blinked on the Irishman's name. Oh yeah, uh, you know. But it's okay. But you know, he waits for the wind to pass before he shoots, right? And he his aim is true. He shoots the guy in the mouth. Mm-hmm. But the fact that there was a breeze going, he's like, nope, nope, I can't fire this. I'm gonna miss. Right. Right. So those days are gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's over. And so any military uh, commander worth their salt in the Civil War starts looking around and going, hey, guys, I think we should come up with some better defenses. And they yeah. do. And that's and, where we get to trenches. Yes. Right? So at the beginning of the war, we're still revolution style, like, let's march out like crazy people. Battle of Manassas. Right. We're going to march straight into each other, and people are going to sit on the hills with picnic baskets and watch. Because we're going to pretend this is the Revolutionary War. Well, and I would say, you know, I mean, this plays out so many times in history. In my mind, this is a pattern of military history. Mm-hmm. It's now 1861. The Revolution is so long ago. I mean, yeah, there was the War of 1812, but let's not make more of it than it was. Sure. And there have been Indian Wars. But again, those are those are um, very small engagements. We're not talking about like, you know, I, I'm not minimizing their impact. But I mean, small in terms of number of people Numbers. participating, people being aware of them. 
Sure. Right. Just as the United States is engaged at, you know, at present, you know, we have troops deployed in places where there's, there's active fire, mm-hmm. but your average American citizen isn't getting a grasp of what life is like for that soldier. Right? right. You go about your day. No one's thinking about Afghanistan. Very few. You yeah, know, very by, few. by and large. Right. So that's what I mean with like the War of 1812 Indian Wars. It has been a lifetime since the average American has had to actually face the ugliness of war Mm -hmm. and really been presented with. So that allows romanticization to set in. And hence we have, yeah, picnic, right? We're just going to watch men be manly. It's going to be awesome. Unfortunately, what we're really going to watch is we're going to watch men shoot at each other with accurate weapons. Yeah. And it's not going to be hundreds of men, maybe up to a few thousand. It's going to be thousands and thousands of men on the battlefield on both sides with really accurate, deadly weaponry and no protection from it. And that's where no one, I mean, uh, you know, our, our dear friend Kump, well, I guess not not dear in Georgia as we established after <laughs> the March to Sea, but he, um, you know, he was called crazy at the get-go in the war when he threw out estimates for the, the death toll that yes. was going to happen. Everyone thought he was insane. And it, by literally. The end, yeah, literally, right? Yeah. And by the end of the war, I suddenly feel very Parks and Rec. Literally, <laughs> um, by the end of the war, he was wrong because he didn't estimate high enough. Right, right. Yeah, and I I think he sees that the technology has changed. Yeah, he got it. Yeah. And, you know, and this is what he means when he says war is hell. Yes. It's... Yeah, he looks around the Battle of Shiloh, Again, no trenches. Yeah. Was, oh my gosh. But by, but by the time you get to the Battle of Petersburg, end of the war, it's nothing but trenches. Right. They're digging tunnels under the trenches. <laughs> yeah. Battle of the Crater, yeah. yeah. So they've, they've figured out, uh, d- not that it's leaving masses alive. I mean, the, the death yeah. toll is still horrific, but they've figured out how to best use, how to best defend themselves from these new advances in technology. Right. And I will just mention briefly before I forget, the um, the Gatling gun's been invented. If you, you were wondering when that was going to show up in the Civil War, we don't actually have any real documented instances of it truly being. So, like, you're going to find some some entries and you know somewhere online or something where someone's going to say, "Yeah, yeah, the Gatling gun was totally used this time." Mm-hmm. Or so. It totally isn't I mean, sustainable. It, it existed. It existed. But yeah, but beyond I, that, I guess the, the the interesting thing to point out: the Gatling gun, by the way, is the earliest form of machine gun. Mm-hmm. Um, what we are seeing is the Civil War, of course, prompts other innovations in more deadly technology. So by the time we get to World War I, that machine gun tech is going to be pretty honed in. Yes. So as as we leave the the Civil War, we've really set the footprint. And and, I mean, even to the ambulance corps, so many of, of the ways that in getting to the trenches, mm-hmm. you can see how the uh, the technology and the shift in battlefield philosophy that's come by the end of the Civil War is being uh, used by European armies. If you mm-hmm. go and think about some of the wars that they're fighting before World War One, and right. then when we get to that massive European, you know, suicide fest. Oh, jeez. Um, you know, it's uh, you, you can you can basically see uh, an echo of late Civil War. Right. On the field. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that's a really good point that you bring up that the other thing that has to change with this new technology is medical care. Yeah. You have to figure out a way if you're going to have that many people get that injured on a battlefield, how do you get them off the battlefield? And what do you do with them once they're off the battlefield? And how many people do you need to care for them and where? So you get the rise of ambulance corps and you get the rise of nursing as a really respected profession because these these nurses have a lot of work to do and you get the you get more advances in uh technology you know in surgeries for how to do yeah. an amputation that actually works well and prosthetics yeah prosthetic nothing wounds. creates a great need for good prosthetics like the civil war yeah like thousands and thousands of people without legs yeah. and arms right right yeah so um the advance in uh medical technology is is another Thing to really address yeah um man <laughs> the conversation's been good i hope no one's bored you with it yet one one last quick break yeah let's okay do it. And, and then we're gonna wrap this bad boy up but assuming we again have so lucky as to have two ads to run then this would be another break
And here's hoping we're back. Because if we left, that means our bills continue to get paid. Uh, exactly. So, so let's move on to some issues, though, that we want to kind of... So let's talk which issues get resolved by the war. Yeah. And I think I would argue that there is one. And that would let's be secession. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. It's the one that's the, truly settled. Right. The question is now settled. It is not a viable option to leave the union once you have joined it. Yes. And everything else we've discussed does not get resolved. Now, I think there are some issues that get pushed forward, and I would say women's rights is one. Yep. Uh, you know, careers in nursing, not so much doctoring, a little bit doctoring, but n- nursing get moved forward. Um, yeah, I mean, other than Mary Edward. Right, you know? right. Yes. I mean, you know, you see these pioneers, right? You see the, the beginnings yeah. well, of it. Well, but that's often how so many of these things go, right? Yes. There's this one isolated figure who manages to crack through. It's It doesn't speak to the general experience of that entire, you know, in this case, women in America. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, and obviously, you know, 1865 all the way to 1920. So, um, right. yeah, it's going to be a while. But I, I do think that the Civil War pushes I mean, then pushes We're, we're talking about the vote there. We're not talking yeah. about, you know, we could go on to a myriad of other issues. At sure. any rate. Yeah, so. yeah, to the vote. Um, so, but I do think the Civil War pushes women's rights forward. Absolutely. Uh, white women's rights forward. Um, uh, so, yeah, there's some issues that do get moved forward. I, I would say that some racism gets lowered by the Civil War as white soldiers fight with black soldiers in the Union Army. Yeah. I would say that there are some people who have it's, their minds it's progress. changed. It's progress. But, yeah, it's it's a step forward. Sure. But, I mean, even as we end it, you know, we get the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments. We're going to cover all this uh, again. Yeah, don't you worry. Know, uh, I always get a little, ah, uh, these epilogues here. Sometimes you kind of got to address things we haven't gotten to, but at the same time, you don't want to, like, Give put it all the away. cart before the horse. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get to this in detail, but as uh, I'm sure some of you have a, a vague grasp, if you have a... Uh, um, if you feel like you have a pretty decent handle on American history already. Uh, for others, you know, you're, you're going to see that even as we get these amendments that end uh, constitutional protection of slavery, that stipulate that color is no longer to be considered in voting rights and, and things like that, that um, the Reconstruction era, as it's referred to, which typically historians go with that ending at uh, the the end of Grant's presidency. Uh, yeah, yeah, 1876. Um, 18, yeah, 1876. Because apparently I said Grant's presidency, like everyone's like, oh yeah, naturally. That's, <laughs> <laughs> we all know that one. Like, sorry, I'm stupid on my part. But um, th- that we're going to get these Jim Crow laws and basically there's going to be ways to, to sidestep. We'll get to Plessy v. Ferguson and, and you'll see how these things get skirted. And this is something that I... I actually think it's worthwhile thinking about on a global perspective. If you think about a lot of the colonial empires that the Europeans have, Mm -hmm. uh, French, British, et cetera, obviously, well, you know my background, I just happen to know the French empire than the British (laughs) empire, both really well. So those are my go-tos. But uh, even as they... um, as they're having debates about you know trying to hold on to different parts of their empire at various right, right, points, right. French, especially in in French Algeria, uh, they they have these conversations about the rights of um, the uh, indigenous peoples in those countries, and that and they often will start talking about e- equal but n- not, but not really. the same, <laughs> and, and, and and so they come up with a class a class system of citizenship. Right. And so, I mean, my go-to example is French Algeria, where uh, the uh, um, Arab and uh, small Berber population, but primarily Arab, by the time you get to 1960, the, um, there's about 7 million total population. There's about a million European descent French mm-hmm. living there, mm-hmm. about 6, 7 million uh, Arabs. And yet the 1 million French have the political power. They have the ability to vote. And there is a vote for the Arabs, uh, but it's in a small college that can't ever overpower. So you just see the way that there's been, they've been given citizenship, but not not, real. Not really. But not a a, um, 
proportional well, share of I power. I hope that was interesting. Was that way too far off the ranch no, there? No, I think it's really important to note that this isn't the only place it's, it's happening. Global. It's global. Yeah, you can global. see... The United States this, is part of that pattern. The, the, this struggle in... I, I love thinking about... I mean, we we love what these nations, whether we're talking about that, I mean, the French, liberté, égalité, fraternité, right? Right, the, right, right? The aspirations of all men are created equal, mm-hmm. right? Th- these are such great aspirations. And then the mental um, pain, the birthing pains of actually getting to that place. Right, that, of actually putting that into action. Yeah, and and seeing how this takes, you know, centuries going from the the Enlightenment era in which these ideas really start, you know, you get these guys like Voltaire who are saying these very crazy ideas, like maybe people should be able to pick their own religion. Yeah. Like, this is earth-shattering. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? No, no. The king picks, otherwise you die. Yeah, right. It, no, the monks show up and give the natives a religion. Thank you. <laughs> right. And and so going from that to, you know, slowly grasping, like, no, 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 no. Race, sex, you know, we're all human beings and we all should have civil rights, human rights, and, mm-hmm. and so forth. And uh uh, just my my background, my specific training. I, I guess every time I think about the American experience, I I see it in this global. Yeah, you know, it's not unique. Yes, it's it's playing out around the world. Right, right. Yeah, that's re- it is interesting to think about the the connections that can be made there. Okay, that wasn't too boring. <laughs> no, no, I love making right, connections. Good. So no, I don't think it was boring. So. Um, yeah, so there's still a lot left on the table, yes. basically, at the end of the Civil War. We've we've solved one problem. Right, which, I mean, if anyone's familiar <laughs> with American history, civil rights, 1960s, for crying out loud, uh, you know, pre- pressing right into the present. Yes. I mean, these are, there are going to be questions and uh, things to, you know, consider for a long, long time. Right. So right. it's hardly like we, when you read those amendments, you on paper, you look at it and go, this should have settled it. It's in the Constitution. It's clear. And yet. And yet. Not yet. So we'll, yeah, yeah we'll cover all of that. We will. We'll, we'll get to it. It'll be yeah. exciting. Okay. Um, so should we move on to some of the Yes, the before crazier? I put too much of that cart in front of the horse. Just <laughs> stop me, CL. Sure. Greg, shut up. So there is some stuff that's going to happen after the war that we know we're not going to cover because it's just too crazy. It's too, well, it's not. Look, we're trying to do a survey. Right. Like, right. These are what we consider like the bare bones that we'd hope any and every American should be exposed to. Sure. So there's some rabbit holes we just can't go down. Even though no matter, awesome. <laughs> no matter how interesting. So I don't know if you guys remember from episode 31, the California Trail and the Donner Party. I'll buy it. 31. Sure. Early 30s at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure because I'm pretty sure Oregon Trail was 30. I'm pretty sure California Trail and Donner Party is 31. That feels right. But anyway. There's this dude that we mentioned this one time in that Lansford episode. Lansford Hastings. Lansford Hastings. He's the guy who uh, proposed to the Donner Party that they cut through Nevada, mm-hmm. go over the Sierras to get to California, you know, faster. Said he totally lead them and then totally didn't. Yeah, totally yeah. ditched them, left them to their own devices. This man has left his mark on history. Yes, he has. And incredibly for all the damage this guy's <laughs> left in his wake has managed to not not be remembered <laughs> right uh, oh and let's also remember he's the guy who wrote the emig- the immigrants guide to Oregon and California in 1845 yeah so uh you know things have dried up life's gotten a little boring for Lansford during the Civil War yep so he decides <laughs> to spice it up again yes he does yeah we don't have records of this so we're pretty sure it happened but it's third you know, it's mm-hmm. it's gossip, basically. Like Robert E. Lee getting that yeah. ominous warning from, from, from Winfield, Winfield, Winfield Scott. Scott. Old fuss and feathers. Right. So Lansford supposedly meets with President Jefferson Davis and says, hey, I could put together a regiment, a CSA regiment uh, from California and yeah. Arizona. He's currently living in Arizona. And Jefferson's like, that, that'd be cool. Here's some money. Yeah. Did that happen? We don't know. But it, it the regiment never comes to fruition. So after the war, um, there are Confederates who are like, yeah, I'm keeping my slaves. And they decide mm-hmm. they're going to head for Brazil where slavery is still legal. Because you're running out of places in the world. Yes, you are. <laughs> but in Brazil, slavery is still legal. Brazil is, um, what was the figure? I think it is like 40% or so. I might be off on that figure. We're going off the top of the head, sure. you know, and we're epilogging here, right? I haven't checked my five sources as I usually like to before yeah, right. I say anything, but 
I believe is about 40% of all slaves, uh, all, all Africans who are ripped away from their homes and transported to the Americas in the, the slave trade. It's like 40% went to Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. I that mean, sounds about right to me. Okay. You can feeling good. We're in the zone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not feeling good. This is awful stuff to discuss, but you know what I mean? Like, right. We're, yeah. We're the, I, I would agree accurate. with that number. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, w- when you think about slavery across the Americas, mm-hmm. yeah, Brazil is ha- heavily invested in the institution of slavery as well. And it continues to exist there even even longer than it did in the United States. Right, right. So a few Southerners are like, hey, let's let's head to Brazil. And Lansford Hastings is like, you know what I should do? I should write a book. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so he writes The Immigrant's Guide to Brazil. He's been there one time. He's an expert. That's all it takes for, <laughs> for good old Lansford Hastings. Yeah. 1867, that, uh, that New York Times bestseller. I'm kidding. I don't know if it's a New York Times. I, I don't I even know if they did it. it back then. But- that's when he writes that guide. And, um, you know, you, you said few, and few is right in, in the larger uh, vision of things, but it's like 10 or 20,000 yeah. Southerners who, I mean, and just think about that, right? Like, that's a, it's a so city. stuck on a, a life that includes having enslaved people that you feel freaking move to brazil like yeah you move to another country to, yeah like, and and uh, when i say like you move to brazil it's not like there's anything wrong with brazil this is the 19th century moving countries like they didn't just hop on a plane right you know, you're never coming in atlanta back. and then you know complain that e- economy was really short on seating and you know they didn't have ginger ale and that was a really frustrating flight. Like, yeah, this is a one-way ticket. It's dangerous. Yeah, it's so dangerous. Lansford Hastings dies uh, in, yeah, uh, on a Caribbean island. The, yeah, Caribbean. Because the ships wouldn't go directly, right? They would make stops. Of course. And, yeah. Yeah, obviously, there is no direct flight. Right. Um. So he dies of yellow fever. Well, probably. Probably, yeah. Again, we get into all these murky corners, but... Sure. Um. I, I mean, that is... It's astounding. And I mean, and to this day, I mean, there are uh, communities in Brazil that are, you know, aware that that's. They're descended from those confederados. Yep. My Portuguese is amazing. I know. (laughs) You're welcome, listeners. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that is the term. So feel free to Google it. There's plenty of, you know, articles and you can read up on on the confederados, which at one point we envisioned doing an episode on them, but we've just decided it's just too. It's just too it's much just of a side. Too much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the one last other side that we kind of hinted at, I mean, we've got to get to now and that's the invention of. Coca-Cola. Co- one of my favorite sodas. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right up there with Dr. Pepper for me. Yeah. So I mentioned this guy, John Pemberton, who was the commander at Vicksburg, who lost Vicksburg. That's not the John Pemberton who invents Coke. Yes. But there is a John Pemberton. He Another is... Another Confederate. Yeah, and he is a Confederate mm, lieutenant uh, what, what? something. Anyway. He's no general. He's no Vicksburg losing he's, general. Right. <laughs> but he ends up... Um, what is his story? He gets injured so in the war. He's injured in, at the end of it in 1865. And then he gets stuck on... Uh, was it morphine? I'm I think? pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he's a morphine so addict. He, yeah, he's trying to find something... To get himself off of morphine and cocaine is seems like a real viable really, option. I, I I don't know all the specifics, and you know we're we're not trying to necessarily do that as a as a full on again you know episode, right? Uh, but he comes up with the basic formula that is going to become Coca Cola as he's trying to nurse himself off of his morphine addiction, which is the result of an injury from the Civil War. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I mean. If, uh, if like me, you enjoy a, a Coke from time to time. Or every day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that might be. Um, yeah, that is another di- indirect, indirect result of I the mean, Civil let, War. Let's call it a technological invas- advancement from the Civil War. It's still around. We it all, still we, we all still enjoy our caffeinated right. sodas at 10 it, in the morning. <laughs> at least it's... <laughs> This is Utah, Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> yes, here, here it's uh, it's, it's getting hit at ten a.m. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean that's it's just fascinating to see the the things that exist in the present. Mm-hmm. You know that and how they get here, right? Yeah, so, and, and yeah, this one that has the direct line back to the Civil War. It's nuts. Yeah, isn't it? 
Okay. Uh, I think we've, we've pretty much done the rounds. Yeah. I think we have. Let's go okay. ahead and wrap this up. Yeah. For all the, uh, for Mike, Mike's still listening yeah. out in Boston. <laughs> um, so the, the last things I think we want to say is um, a lot of people just asked, where are we going from here? Cause we've been in the civil war for so long. Right. Good question. We don't know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we do have a plan. We do. And again, you know that the large view, we are marching through U.S. history. So you know that that's generally what's happening. But um, basically, as we get out of 1865, I mean, obviously, we're going to see Lincoln's assassination. But to get to a larger point, we've, we kind of got three things that were hidden. Yeah. We're going to hit Reconstruction. Of course. Uh, do a few episodes on that. We're going to talk about Indian Wars that have been going yes. on during the Civil War and that are going to continue after the Civil War. Yeah, we, and, you know, we've, we've touched on uh, in, Indigenous lives um, from the, you know, Trail of Tears. We talked about the f- first uh, treaty with uh, under George Washington mm-hmm. and uh, some of the comments he had to say on that. And, of course, e- even going back to episode one, I mean, we talked about uh, the Iroquois and, right, right, we, and, and we've the seen, Ohio. We've seen, you know, battles picked in the French and Indian War in the War of 1812. Yep. Yeah. But uh, we are now hitting 18, basically post-Civil War into the next few decades. These are prime years, if you will. So even though Indian Wars have been going on and we couldn't hit all of them without it basically becoming an Indian War podcast, right? Right. Uh, Just like all the other things that we wish we could do forever, but we can't. Uh, But we're entering that era, so it's definitely time to do uh, a solid, you know, we'll kind of see how it plays out, but... At least a few yeah, episodes. Yeah, a few episodes where we really dive deep on what's going on with uh, with Indigenous Americans and yeah. the, the experience that's hap- that, that's happening there. These right. wars, these Civil War heroes who are now being sent west to to deal with the Dakota yeah. and the Sioux and the yeah. So we're gonna do that and um, transcontinental railroad. We are. We're gonna we connect. Are. East and we west I mean, at Promontory Point. Here it's going to be exciting. Here at Utah, we have to have a special little, you know, excitement about. You know, every state has their thing. That's right. It's exciting. It's it's our thing. It is. Yeah. Yeah. This is where the Transcontinental Railroad connected, which you will learn about That's in a right. future episode. <laughs> and of course, we're, I guess, maybe with the Transcontinental, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get some good Wild West uh, action in there. Definitely. That's definitely happened. Might even mention the Pony Express once or twice. Just maybe. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe. Again, as Westerners, you know, we we have to be a little excited about that. Yeah. I mean, everyone in Missouri is going, what are you guys talking about? I I live in a town where it's not ironic or old fashioned to wear cowboy boots. Yeah. You know, like that's Utah. Yeah. That's so. um, I think, I think that kind of does it. Yeah. 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 That's where we're headed. Hey, just. Thank you, everyone. This is, it's crazy. Honestly, that's how I feel sometimes as we keep making this podcast and all of you who are listening and thank, thank you for your messages. I, I apologize we, if, if any of them ever fall through the cracks. We really try to, I don't think. I, really we really try happen. to get back to all of them. Um, but, but yeah. There's a part of me that just thinks, I know there's got to be the post here or there or something that, you know, eludes us, but um, thank you. I mean, it's, it is humbling. It's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thanks for listening and learning along with us. You know, I've learned so much as we've done the civil war. So I knew you would still, I was really glad. (laughs) (laughs) It was really important that I learned (laughs) the difference between a musket and a rifle. And I did. (laughs) That's right. That's, that's going to save you on jeopardy someday. Someday. (laughs) All right. Well, all that said, um, oh, and next time I will just tell you, uh, don't flip out. It'll be exciting. We're not going to go right into Lincoln's assassination, which we hinted at in the last episode. We're actually going to give you a little retro experience. The uh, theme song that's been that we revamped with Airship was recorded by uh, th- that violin and, and cello in there. Th- that was recorded by some talented musicians that tour when COVID isn't going on with the Hamilton musical, and so kind of a little nod to them, a little. Thank you to them. Uh, Airship is going to remaster the uh, Hamilton Bird Duel episode, so you're you're going to get to you know it, we love and enjoy Josh's uh, s- sound, and now we're going to experience it with Airship and let the Hamilton musicians be present in the Hamilton episode. Right. So we're going to throw that at you, and after that, we're grab your tissues because we're heading to a theater with Lincoln. 
It's going to be a great story. It is. Somber, sad, well, both of them. But join me in two weeks where I'd like to tell you a story. History That Doesn't Suck is created and hosted by me, Greg Jackson. Researching and writing by Greg Jackson and C.L. Salazar. Production by Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound design by Derek Behrens. Theme music composed by Greg Jackson. Arrangement and additional composition by Lindsey Graham of Airship. For a bibliography of all primary and secondary sources consulted in writing this episode, visit htdspodcast.com. HTDS is supported by fans at patreon.com forward slash history that doesn't suck. CL and I are beyond grateful to you kind souls providing funding to help us keep going. Thank you. And a special thanks to our patrons whose monthly gift puts them at producer status. Zach Ashton, Will Caldwell, Jason Carstens, John Frugal Dougal, Keith Downer, Bob Drazovich, Michael and Rachel Ercolini, Drew Hill, Andrew Fortunati, Brandon Hallett, Bryce Hancock, Brad Herman, Dex Jones, John Leach, Jeffrey Moots, Brandon Shaw, Scott Slaymaker, David Summer, and Doug Woodall. Join me in two weeks where I'd like to tell you a story.